Okay, hello everyone. Good day. So today we are going to have a look at a very interesting and very important topic regarding the plant requirement. So this is going to be very useful because you are growing um, your vegetables now um, in the field. So while the growing and development of the plant I mean, your vegetable is taking place. I want you to pay attention of the surrounding of the components that you give or that you control to your plants until harvest. Okay, because plants, whether it's crop or herbs, trees, flowers, bush, and so on, these are all living things. So just like you, they also have requirements that you need to fulfill so that they can grow from the seeds or from the baby plant and then progressively become bigger and then turn into uh, a mature plant that you can harvest and, you know, have for your own uh, consumption or maybe you want to sell. Okay, All right. So let's have a look. Um, I actually, um, some years back, I created um, this um, formula to, to remember what are these requirements that are needed by the plant, okay? Oh, not to worry about, about this logo down here, uh, because this is the same slide that I use for my consultation service as well. Uh, I, I work as a consultant at this um, company, okay? So uh, this formula, um, we call it as the allowing formula, All right? Why is it? Simply because um, if plants receive all these requirements, it's going to allow the plants to grow healthily, help the plant to grow or to develop normally, and of course, by extension, will enable you to gain more harvest and therefore more money. So these components are A for air, L for light, W for water, and nutrients, and G for growing medium. Okay, so we, we're going to look at each of these and its subcomponents. Okay, let's start with air. So under the air, um, um, uh, category, there are a couple of things that you need to pay attention to when you want to have a very healthy and happy looking plant. Okay, so uh, these are the same components that we also um, pay attention to as humans. Okay, so these includes the, um, the, the gas that are present abundantly in our atmosphere such as the oxygen and also the carbon dioxide and also you need to pay attention to the humidity and also the temperature okay um, humidity actually it's important because this is also a gas component it's your water your water in the form of vapor right and then temperature right okay let's have a look um, what about temperature so we know that uh, our plant is a living organism. I, I mentioned this last week during our um, uh, practical session because cells contain lots of enzymes, proteins, metabolites, and so many other compounds. They require um, what we call as optimum temperature to function. Takes um, enzymes. For example, it's a type of protein. When you increase the temperature, the activity of the enzyme is going to increase. Okay, because remember, heat equals energy. Okay, so the higher the temperature is, the more energy is going to be available for the enzyme to carry its reaction. Okay, I mean, like it's pretty much like like. Us now we will live in tropical um, 
environment, right? So we, we're very active. We go on and about compared to people who live in, um, um, say, North Pole, you know, just stay in the igloo, stay immobile, stay very close to each other and try as much to preserve um, energy. OK, so when you have heat, you have energy, you can do lots of things. OK, you are very highly energized. However, too much heat is not going to do any good to your plant because um, the enzymes, it's going to undergo the, the denature uh, process, meaning that the enzyme due to very high temperature, it's going to lose its um physical or 3D conformation. And when this happens, the enzyme can no longer function as it's intended to do so. And some of these um, uh, phenomena are actually non-reversible, especially when the temperature has gone up too high, for example, at 50 or 60 degree. Okay, so that's why if temperature is very important, yeah, so that your enzyme, your proteins, your metabolized compounds can ha um, have the function that they are meant to do. And also, um, they do not have to worry about, oh, I am broken now, so let's repair myself. No, no, no time needed to be wasted to repair itself when the temperature is optimum. Okay, yeah, so um, that's on the cellular level, on the physical level of the plants, when the temperature is high, um, there's a very good likelihood that your plant physically is going to experience some um, symptoms like the scorching, burning, and so on, right? Okay, humidity. Um, so humidity is actually um, the amount of water vapor um, that can be contained in a given environment for that given uh, uh, temperature and also for that given elevation. Okay, so um, let's say that if you have uh, a room uh, and this room is at sea level at temperature of say 25 degree Celsius, so let's say that this room can. Um, contain about 100 liter of water in the form of vapor in the form of gas okay the same room if you change the location let's say you bring it up to Cameron Highland where it is very cold there so the temperature is about 15 degrees Celsius uh, and the elevation is very high so the the similar room will have less capacity to hold uh, water vapor, okay? It's no longer 100 liter uh, that it can uh, withhold. It's much lesser now, all right? So that's the basic idea. So the moment it, it hits uh, the word relative in anything, you must know that it is actually comparing to something, okay? So when you have a given room, when the room capacity is to hold certain amount of water vapor, let's say that 100 um, liter. And then when you use a machine, for example, like a hygrometer, you measure that, oh, actually, um, the water vapor um, content now is around uh, 70 liter only. Okay, so um, 70 liter out of the maximum 100 liter, that is actually 70%, right? So that is what meant by relative humidity it's comparing comparing to what comparing to a standard or to the maximum capacity of a something all right so high humidity um the the air cools and uh, so there's a lot of explanation there i just put here this is good when when the humidity is is high your your plants is going to open the stomata Okay, remember, stomata are the little mouth or pores on your uh, plant surface or especially the leaf surface. They're going to breathe out 
um, or sweating a lot of um, moisture. So this is going to give a cooling effect um, to the plants. Okay, but in in the area where the humidity is low, um, and temperature tends to be high as well, uh, so the plants tend to close the stomata, and your um, plants will, if nothing happening um, soon, if they are not used to it, maybe it's some kind of, you know, very pampered plants, they're going to experience what we call as water stress, right? Yeah, so humidity, relative humidity is very important um, in reference to the stage of your plant, whether it's in a rooting um cutting um, phase, the propagation, vegetative flowering, or fruiting, okay? Right, so in general, we try to keep the humidity around 50 to 60%. Yeah, 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 because you don't want too much of humidity because that's going to cause uh, other problems such as the fungal attack, okay? You don't want that to happen, right? So, and about the oxygen concentration, we all require this, okay? Not only plants, you too require oxygen. Even though plants can produce as a byproduct, ox uh, that is the oxygen from the process of photosynthesis, plants still require oxygen, okay? Where does plant use oxygen for, th for the process of cellular respiration? Right, so this is where you get your mitochondria um, uh, functioning uh, a lot, and the oxygen is going to be used um, abundantly now. And so you, the product here, you're going to get your ATP, which is the energy, and also you get going to get the CO2 as byproduct as well. Okay, so oxygen is very important. Okay, plants use CO uh, oxygen, you use your oxygen as well. The difference is plant can make their own oxygen, all right? You can't do that. Okay, CO2. So CO2, as we know, this is the ingredient for your photosynthesis, all right? Okay, yeah. So specifically, so this is the uh, typical cross-section of a plant cell. You know this because there is a clear um, cell wall structure. So these green blobs here are actually the chloroplast. Okay, if we further cross section the chloroplast and we look inside of it, you're going to have this kind of environment. So these stack of uh, green pancakes are actually where the plants capture the sunlight. Okay, so this is what we um where you will get your photo system. Okay, uh, it's got a name, but I'm not going to to go in too detail into it. All right, so these text of pancake we call it as um the the granum. Okay, plural for that is grana. Okay, um, where does your CO two require it? It's here. In this Kelvin cycle, so your CO two is fixed here together with 5-carbon sugar, with the help of enzyme, of course, uh, so that you can get a precursor to build the glucose, that is your sugar, right? So CO2 here um, is the reason we all have our um, sugar, yeah? As simple as that, okay. Right, <clears throat> so um, the second category, is the light, right? So what about um, the light, okay? There are two things about, about, about light that you need to pay attention. I know there, there's three here, but uh, let's focus uh, on two, uh, the first two first. Um, one thing about light is, light is actually, if you learn physics, you're going to appreciate this more, okay? Light is actually a mystery because it can have what we call as um, dual properties right? Dual properties. So light can exist in the form of particle, right? Light can also be present in the form of wave. Yeah, so light particles 
scientifically we call it uh, as photon, right? So you, not proton, that is the subatomic particles, the positive one. This is photon, right? Yeah. Another properties of light is the wave. Okay. So this is usually denoted with um, the lambda. Okay. Uh, lambda equals uh, the wavelength. Okay. So light has these properties, two properties at the same time. It's kind of puzzling, uh, the physicists actually. Uh, but they have proven that this is actually the case. So light is a very, very mysterious um, um, entity. Okay, So when we talk about light um, from the perspective of particles like photons, we actually referring to light intensity. Okay, How abundant is the photon? Okay, How abundant is the photon? Okay. However, when we talk about the second light properties, the wave, the light wavelength, so the unit here usually nanometer, actually this is referring to the spectrum or the color. Okay, you're going to see in a, in a bit why. Because depending on the wavelength, it will determine what color the light is going to have uh, in our eyes, okay? Right, so let's have a look uh, closer. So let's uh, look at the spectrum. Uh, remember, this talk about um, the light quality. Quality, it talks about lambda, it talks about nanometer, it talks about wavelength, okay? So um, when you look at this, this whole thing is um, um, the whole spectrum that you can get from, for example, the, the sun, the sunshine. Okay, so the light originates from the sun. Let's let's draw our sun here, very very far away from the sun here. So your sun is going to have all of this light uh, uh, wavelength, the nanometer. Okay, from ten to the power of of minus 12 meters all the way to one kilometer with, uh, of wavelength, okay? Okay, just, just to, to, to um, so that you can recall, the wavelength is when the light completes its life cycle, okay? When in reference to time, so this is your time, okay? All right, all right, so when you have your light, uh, your wave here, like this, okay. So the point from here back to here, this is what we call as um, one cycle of your wavelength, okay. Compared to um, the second one, so this is what uh, maybe I can label this as um, long wave. Okay, if I draw something else, let's use blue now. Yeah. In the shorter amount of time, for the blue one, it, it will have the ability to complete the cycle, okay? So this is what we call as the short wave, okay? Long wave, short wave, okay? So let's, let's use uh, back uh, my, um, my marker color. I like this color, so that's why I'm using it, okay? Yeah, so the information that you need to make stick to your head is long wave, equals to low energy, okay? Short wave equals to high energy. Why? For the long wave, 
it takes longer time to complete one cycle. So it, it's more relaxed, okay? It's spread out. But for the short wave, like the blue one here, it takes lesser time to complete a cycle. So it will have more cycle for the same amount of time when it's compared to the longer wave, okay? So the implication for this is when this wavelength comes to the Earth, so this is our Earth, okay? If the wavelength is about 700 nanometer, your eyes will perceive, by eye, I mean the retina, okay, the special region, the cells uh, at the back of your eye, will perceive this as the red color, okay? But if um, uh, the wavelength that comes into the earth in the forms of 400 nanometer, your retina, your eyes will perceive this as blue, all right? So the color of light, the quality of light is actually determined by the wavelength, okay? The wavelength here, right? So what is the wavelength for the red color? It's about 700 nanometer, okay? And what about um, uh, the color for the blue? It's about 400 nanometer, right? So what's uh, in between? Yeah, uh, so you have the green here. So the green here is, is usually 550 nanometer, okay? So that's what they call, sometimes you see people use the word quantum, okay? So these are basically the packets, packets of energy, okay? You can imagine the sun actually showering upon you many, 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 many bits of um, quantum, okay? Each of this bit has its own energy value. Maybe this bit here is uh, 600 nanometer, maybe this bit here 603 nanometer, maybe this bit here is 700 nanometer, maybe this bit here is 250 nanometer, which is very uh, dangerous because this, this means that this is a UV light. Yeah, so this shower of um energy bits when they come together you will see the white light the sunlight because all colors are present okay but when they come distinctly um just concentrated in one wavelength you're going to see a very distinct color depending on the ability of your um retina okay so for human we can see from 400 to 700 nanometer and that is your light quality, right? For the intensity, I'm so sorry about this. I should have um, deleted this earlier. Okay, let me um, delete that. All right, okay, that looks much better. All right, so for light intensity, this talk about the light quantity. Okay, how come? Because it refers to the photon the light particles, okay? So when we use the phrase light particles, meaning that there's a tendency you want to ask, does that mean we can count light? Yes, you can count light when you talk light in the sense of photons or light particles, okay? There is a machine. Um, I don't have the picture here, but maybe I can show you later. Um, uh, you, uh, scientifically, um, many equipment here, they have this uh, special unit to measure um, uh, light intensity here, okay? So this is the unit. Micromole per second per meter square, all right? Uh, for um, usually our our light that we have here during the uh, the noon time, uh, it's very intense, right? So the reading usually reads around two thousand um, micromole per second per given area. All right, pay attention to this. This is mole. 
here. So when it's small, we know that the sensor of the machine is actually quantifying something countable. Because we know the mole comes from the Avogadro's constant. What is it? I hope you still uh, remember that. 6.02 times 10 to the power of 23. So that's a lot of photons coming in your direction. Okay, Where uh, do these photons go? So they are going to be responsible for the for energizing the photosystem in the chloroplast, okay? Right, for what? When the photosystem is energized because of this um, uh, light intensity, remember this light intensity um, only tells you how many, how many photons, okay? Light intensity, intensity how many photons, okay? Each of these photon will have its own lambda, which is the wavelength, okay? Each of these photon, okay? So these photons will cause a cascade of reactions, activating chlorophyll and so on, so that at the end, two products can be achieved. The energy products actually, namely the ATP, adenosine triphosphate if you are wondering and also the another product which is called NADPH nicotinamide adenine uh, dinucleotide phosphate H mean reduced okay so um, I'm not going to go into detail about this so just just so that you know this whole process of the photosystem actually to get these two products, ATP and also NADPH, right? Yeah. And the third thing under the light category is the photophorid. How long your plants receive the light? Okay, because some plants uh, have this category, what we call as the short day plants and also the long day plants, meaning that some plants. Some species that are plant, okay, not all of them, they require um, less photo period or less um, duration of light in order to flower. Okay, if they receive um, an even distribution of light duration, for example, they, they receive um, a more day, okay. Uh, for example, that uh, maybe this is uh, 15 hours and then the darkness only around um, uh, 9 hours. Yeah. So when, when this happened, this plant, uh, for example, the rose here, it's not going to flower. It's going to be uh, in vegetative state for a very long time. But the moment you reduce the light duration, make it uh, shorter, uh, the, um, the photo period here, the light will start to flower again, okay? So it doesn't matter whether it, it's being given um, like intermittently, uh, we, we are more concerned about uh, the cumulative effect of it, okay? Some plants, on the other hand, they are long day plants. In order for them to flower, they require um, higher amount uh, no, a longer amount of, of light duration, okay? So there is a third, third uh, plant, actually, uh, that we call as a day-neutral plant, okay? Um, these are the plants that don't care whether they receive light um, in a long period of time or short period of time. They don't care. They just care about the light, um, light uh, quality. Yeah. So for our country, like Malaysia, a tropical country, we 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 really don't have to worry about this because most most of the plant um they are actually um they they neutral. Okay, they're going to flower anyway. Okay, because our uh our region is close to the equator, 
So when that happens, the light kind of, you know, equivalent for the day uh, and also the darkness also about the same amount of time, all right? Okay, so to bring, to bring things uh, into perspective, uh, so this is the summary of what you just learned up to this point. Uh, with the light intensity, as you increase, your photosynthesis is going to increase as well, and then it's going to plateau. Why? Uh, because photosynthesis, in order for that to happen, it requires um, ingredients, okay? So maybe there are certain things which are limiting here. It can be anything. It can be CO2, which is limiting. Um, it, can, it can be um, energy is limiting, right? If you increase um, any of these limiting components, this graph here is going to go up again before they start to plateau back, okay? And the same story is for the carbon dioxide concentration as well, right? But for the temperature, for example, like uh, the earlier example here, there I used the enzyme example. When you increase the temperature, yes, it's going to increase, but if you increase it any further, it's going to jump uh, right back down because the enzyme, as the temperature increase, high temperature, it's going to undergo um, denaturation, and this will um, disturb uh, the structure of the enzyme to the point it can no longer function as it should be. Okay. All right. The fat component is the water. You need water, plants need water, okay? We um, we are actually a water organism. Can I say that? Yeah, because we, we require water a lot, okay? So what, what is it in water? So in water, uh, a couple of things are uh, important, uh, which is uh, the uh, oxygen content, the temperature, pH, and also the EC, okay? We're going to look at them uh, one by one. Okay. Oxygen. I know that um, under the air category, we also talk about oxygen. However, this is oxygen in the form of gas. Now, we talk about oxygen in the form of liquid. Yeah. Why is it important? Because some plants are aquatic plants, like this rice here. It can be aquatic plant or semi-aquatic. Yeah, some plants are completely terrestrial. Yeah, regardless, when you look at the, the um, root cross-section, you're going to see that even though the plant is aquatic, there is still some amount of the soil or the ground that the root is in is having the um, aerobic soil, meaning that it's not completely water altogether. There's a region of aerobic uh, where you can get oxygen. Okay, all right. So oxygen is very important for the root, right? I mean, like the plants can receive oxygen uh, from the leaf, but that's going to make a very long journey uh, all the way to the roots. So the roots actually can absorb its uh, own oxygen and also some plants also have their um, reproductive or fruiting structure um, in the ground so that the oxygen can go much quicker to the intended organ. So the organ here can be root and then for example for our um, groundnuts here, uh, can go to the um, fruiting, fruiting organ, okay, like the groundnut here, right? So oxygen is very important. So the plants can take uh, up oxygen from the entry of the leaf and also from the root and to some degree actually from the stem as well. Yeah, it's it's pretty much like like us. Okay, we we require oxygen abundantly, and so do plants, right? So the water that the plants absorb, um, if it's too hot, it's actually going to cause the rest of the plant to be hot as well, and then this is not good because 
hot water. Okay, hot um, water. The moment the plant absorb, water should be cooling. Okay, water should be cooling. When the water is warm, and it's going to interfere with the activity of the earlier states, enzyme proteins, and so on. Okay, so the impact is pretty much um, uh, detrimental, just like the hot air surrounding. Okay, so that's why water. Um, it's very good to have the water and in a low um temperature, right? Temperature, okay. So, um, this water, when it is able to go up the plant and then do this um cooling process, so the plant can uh, regulate the temperature successfully. Okay. Therefore, despite the intense radiation from the sunshine or very strong wind blowing causing the plants to dry up super fast as long as the water um, can go up to the rest of the plant and do the cooling and then replenish back the moisture all is good all right yeah um if you if you take a, th um, a thermometer and then you measure the, the soil, the water in the soil, it's a, a lot um, cooler actually. I, I did the, the measurement once before. So the air temperature that time was around 32 degrees Celsius. Okay, the above ground temperature. But when I measure the temperature um, uh, for the underground water, uh, the, the temperature was only around 23 degrees Celsius. So that's yeah a lot of different yeah so the plants uh, need this to survive okay yeah water um uh, also dissolves uh, minerals and carry on uh, carry uh, ions uh, inside the plants because plants require nutrients okay plants require elements elements just like you you know uh, things like carbon hydrogen and so on okay um, so usually these are the, uh, the things that the plants um, require however even though we know that um, in our soils have lots of these um, elements for example nitrogen phosphorus potassium calcium magnesium sulfur boron copper zinc and so on these can be unavailable for the roots to uptake okay depending on the ph ph is simply means the hydrogen potential okay p here stands for the potential or some people call it power okay when the ph is acidic some of the macronutrients meaning that elements required in large amount by the plants are not going to be available there are there there are there in the nutrient solution or in the soil but they are just not available um, to the plants because they are being clogged in very tightly by the soil particle by the water or the, by the water right <clears throat> so uh, farmers usually do something like liming okay to increase the temperature uh, no, sorry, not the temperature, to increase the pH so that these macronutrients like NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, becoming available uh, for your plant's uh, uptake and consumption. Okay. However, if the liming has gone too far, now to the point that it, it has become too basic, alkaline, the trace elements, the micronutrients, um, like uh, iron, manganese, boron, uh, copper, and zinc are going to be unavailable. Not so much a problem to the um, macronutrients, but for the trace elements, when it's too uh, a strong um, al uh, alkaline. Okay, so it's always to be somewhat in the middle here. So the happy um, uh, pH for most plants is around 
5.5 to 6.5 pH, okay? So if your plants can have something around here, usually they are very, very happy, okay? Uh, regardless of the plant species, okay? And another one is the um, electrical conductivity or EC. So this basically tells you about the, the abundance of nutrients um, in, in the water or in the soil, okay? So as you can see here, um, so your plants uh, require all of these uh, elements, right? So the moment these elements dissolve in water, we can actually measure this because they are in the ionic form, okay? So it, it just tells you how abundant are these ions of all of these elements um, coming together, okay? All right, so um, when the concentration of nutrient is high, you are going to have higher current uh, rate. The flow of the current is going to be uh, very much faster. So this is going to be translated into this uh, machine here, the EC meter. So the EC meter is going to measure this uh, in the unit of um, <coughs> micro ohms. Okay, so that's why you see um, um, symbol here. Or uh, very, very frequently, they're going to measure this in the form of micro Siemens for EC. Okay. Micro cements. All right. So these are actually um, commonly what people are oh, sorry, what the plants would like to have for the micro cement reading. Okay. So initially it's around 6200 um, or to, to 1800 uh, micro and and so on. Okay. Yeah. As you can see, the concentration of your uh, nutrients are going to increase as your plants becoming more active or gets bigger okay yeah so this is a very good way to <clears throat> assess the nutrients uh, concentration um, in your uh, in your nutrient solution like your hydroponic system however it doesn't tell you for example like um, the reading here is 20 2800 micro siemens and then the reading here is 60, 1600 micro siemens this this is the um, total reading, the cumulative reading. It doesn't tell you if this guy is low, what is low? Is it nitrogen is low or phosphorus is low or potassium is low? What about other other elements? Are they low as well? No, this thing doesn't doesn't tell you that. That you need to um, take some samples of the water or soil and then send to the lab for a more definitive and um, a confirmed reading for individual uh, el elemental um, analysis, okay? Right, uh, regardless, this is a very um, handy tool to have around, right? So, um, but most of the time, if you have uh, the reading as suggested, because um, when you do things like hydroponic, you, know, you uh, dissolve the solution, with the um, uh, salts from 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 the manufacturer, um, they have calibrated in such a way. If the reading is this much, more or less, they're going to have a balanced amount of all of these elements, right? So remember to follow the instruction very closely. Okay, uh, make your own stuff if you are sure. If not, just follow the instruction. Okay, and on the nutrients, okay, uh, I know I have touched about it uh, much earlier, but uh, let's have a look anyway. Uh, two things about nutrients is the composition and also the purity. Um, depending on the literature that you're referring, some literature will say that you need 16 elements to make the plants happy from the beginning until the end to complete its life cycle. Some will say 18 elements. Um, I tend to stay in the middle, so I, I used a 17, okay? So if it's 16 elements, uh, the, the, the literature omits the nickel, 
uh, if it's 18, it includes the um, silicon as well. All right. So what are these um, 17 elements? Okay, we I use this. Okay, 17 elements. How many elements are there uh, on the periodic table of elements? <clears throat> I think it should be around 120 now. Okay, so uh, plants do not require all 120 of elements uh, on the periodic tables. They only require more or less um, uh, 17 elements. Okay, these are the elements. Uh, we have the Cho, the carbon backbone, which are non-mineral because you can get these from, you know, from the gas, uh, CO2 and so on. And then you have the mineral form, which is the macro and PK, secondary macro includes um, calcium, magnesium and sulfur. And then you've got your micronutrients, right? All these um, boron, chlor 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 chlorine, uh, copper, iron, manganese, uh, molybdenum, silicon, sodium, zinc, right? <clears throat> so um, all of these, as long as they are present, the plants can complete its life cycle. However, if you if you want the plant to look healthy, some of these are going to be required in different amounts depending on the plant's age. For example, when the plant is actively making leaves in its vegetative form, nitrogen is required in large amount. Okay, not so much for the uh, for uh, potassium. However. Uh, the moment the plant has reached uh, the reproductive uh, phase, it starts to bloom, start to flower, produce fruit, and so on. Potassium, the K, is going to be needed in larger amounts. So that's why we have fertilizer based on the plant's phase. Okay, we have the um, leaf fertilizer, flower fertilizer, fruit fertilizer, some like uh, the rooting fertilizer and so on okay that is the reason right and then the purity okay this is important if you want to calculate your own fertilizer remember when you have your fertilizer they are going to uh, come in the form of compound fertilizer okay you want the potassium however potassium cannot come on its own okay it's going to cause a huge explosion so it comes in the form of salt salt there's always something else okay for example like the potassium here it comes in the form of potassium nitrate so if it, it's advisable for example that your uh, vegetables or your your uh, flowers to have uh, maybe 20 kilograms of potassium for an acre so you need to use this um, molecular formula to calculate for the actual fertilizer application rate okay so uh, so this is very important and also imp uh, important uh, if you do uh, tissue culture yeah so some uh, because there is no way you can ignore the compounds inside uh, inside uh, your minerals or inside your salts even though these are the primary elements that you are looking for Okay, because these are going to give impacts to your uh, the growing medium of your plants, and you don't want too much of certain stuff. Okay, for example, this is already in the form of potassium nitrate, so maybe you can reduce um, your say urea uh, uh, usage because potassium nitrate you already have two things in one. You get potassium, you got the nitrogen source. Right, right. So things like that to 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 pay attention to. Okay. All right, and finally, it's the um, growing medium. Okay. Some people argue with me about this. Uh, they say that no, growing medium is not a requirement for plants. Well, I I tend to differ on that because um, plants need um, anchorage. Okay, it's not like the plants have a leg. Okay, right? It's not like it has um it has uh uh it's mobile. Okay, so it needs a good home, a good home, a good base, so that it can absorb the nutrient, so that it can stand on. 
okay, to stands on and also to absorb uh, water plus nutrients. Okay, um, so this is something to do with um, uh, the components of your growing medium. Okay, uh, uh, for example, we take the soil here. Depending on your soil texture, uh, your, your soil type, some soil are very compact, okay, depending on the size of the soil particles, okay. So when this happens, the root is going to have a harder time to penetrate and, and, and go down, okay. Uh, however, when the soil um, in the combination of bigger chunks, medium chunks, smaller chunks, and, and finer chunks, the plants will have um, not only a good anchorage, but also a good um, access to various nutrients. Yeah. So because each of these soil particles here, for example, the clay, the nutrients that you learned earlier, like the um, calcium, um, like the iron, like the magnesium, all these um, cations, okay, the positively charged ion, they, uh, they don't roam about aimlessly or floating about in the soil. No, they are actually uh, what we call as adsorbed. This is the word here, absorb, meaning that they are, they latches just on the surface of the soil. In the, in the example here, on the surface of the clay. Okay. Yeah. So the moment the plant is growing, like the roots here is growing, the roots will um, release uh, stuff like hydrogen ions. So when this happens, um, the ion which is absorbed um, to the surface of the clay is going to be displaced. Okay, when it is displaced, the calcium is free, and then the root can easily absorb this calcium um, all the way into the plant. Okay, so this is a very important terminology. It's not the same as absorb. Okay, absorb means uh, the entire thing goes into the main um, substance. So this is absorbed. Okay. What we are having here is just the absorbed. Okay. Uh, so uh, for soil scientists uh, to quantify this capacity of uh, the soil, whether it's a good or not, they use what we call as CEC cations exchange capacity. Yeah, how 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 abundance your uh, soil, your particular type of soil have cations, and how good are these soils to give up the uh, cations so that the plants can can use that. All right. Okay. Yeah. So the air content is also important because again the roots surrounding it always have this region of aerobic. The moment you see the word aerobic, always associate that with oxygen, always, okay? Because the roots got cells. Cells need to do cellular respiration, and cellular respiration require oxygen, right? Yeah, and finally is the moisture content, okay? So um, moisture content is simply um, how, how much um, the, the medium can um, contain the water so that the plant can have easy access, not only easy access to water, but also continuous access to um, the water, right? Okay, so uh, for example, you can have a look at here, uh, for a given type of soil, uh, you have some amount of air, some amount of water, some amount of mineral, and some amount of organic matter. So Air and water, two components alone, already occupy almost the half of uh, the stuff which is present um, surrounding the root region. So that's why it's very important. Uh, this is from my previous lecture actually. So I was talking about the porosity and tortuosity. 
Okay, porosity is how how much uh, empty spaces are present for a given um, area of your soil. Okay, tortosity is um, how how easy for uh, uh, the water, for example, to travel across a distance of this soil. Okay, so uh, for example, that I have over here, so I have uh, sand example here. So the the tortuosity is basically how twisted things are. Your uh, medium can be very porous which is good. It has got um, lots of oxygen in it. But if the tortuosity um, is very high, the water will take longer time to go all the way to the bottom because the journey takes um, longer time. Okay, Rather than um, when you have also the same porosity, but the soil particles are much um, spaced, like this, giving a relatively much linear passage for the water by extension of course roots to penetrate all the way uh, throughout uh, the soil. Okay, So these two things uh, always come hand in hand together. The porosity and tortuosity. Porosity, it's um, uh, the, the air, air percentage. Tortuosity is how twisted, twisted, uh, degree of twisted. Okay, how 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 long does it take for water or for the root um, to to go down to, all the way to the bottom? Uh, given that this is the passage uh, for your uh, medium. All right. Okay, so that's all for the plants uh, requirements. The uh, the basic fundamentals requirements to make your plants very happy and healthy. You got air, light, water, nutrients, and growing medium. So bring all of these together, you can grow your plant just anywhere. Um, in the international space um, system, you can grow your plants um, in Mars, I do not know. Can you get a good uh, air quality uh, in Mars? In the cave, it doesn't matter, okay? The plants, as long as they have all these allowing components, they're going to say, yeah, that's it. I can complete my life cycle. All right. All right. So that's all for now. So if you got any questions, you can ask me later. And happy growing. And I hope you have an enjoyable time while growing your vegetables. All right. And I'll see you again later then. Bye.